The Paperclip Murders, Chapter 13, Knuckles That Could Fill Dempsey. Woodchuck, it turned out, was taking a business meeting out of the office, but after I insisted that I be connected with him post-haste, if not pre-haste, I learned that he was lunching down at the cricket club. Swanky, and just the sort of place I'd like to breeze into and flash a few eyebrows around, like I had him. So I bustled off, after making sure that I brought an old friend with me, a single brass knuckles that can fill Dempsey. Yes, single. A pair would fit on both hands since there'd be two of them. Hence, a pair, right? Don't correct me. The cab ride down was short and sweet, and full of the absence of steely-eyed gunmen and exotic ninja assassins, just the way I liked it. I lit from the cab onto the street, tossed the cabbie a fiver, straightened my hat, and walked into the joint like I owned the place. The doorman flipped me one of his own patented eyebrows, but he didn't say anything, so I let him remain standing and brushed up to the concierge's desk. He was a man with a Third Reich mustache and an expression that said, Don't bother me, I might have a thought. And for whatever reason, this brought the need out of me to just throw a punch or two at the guy and see how he liked it, but I restrained myself. The old cigarette flipped up into my mouth as I glowered at him. Can I help you? he asked his eyes tracking the cigarette like it was a plague rat. From his tone, he wasn't at all interested in helping me, unless it meant getting me out of his establishment, but trifles were trifles. I waved a hand in the air absently. I'm expected. Woodchuck. Lunch for two. Important meeting. Now, I breathed, and flipped my eyebrows up and down at him until his expression changed from disdain to mildly disdaining surprise. This way he said in a clipped manner, and then he led me back beyond the hollow doors, and I took in the sounds of chatter and the clink of glasses and platters. Woodchuck appeared to be enjoying himself at the table I was led to, and I slid into the booth opposite him with a, Thanks, Igor, cast off to my left. My eyes locked on Woodchuck's countenance. Igor got even more stiff, and shuffled off with a huff, and I took off my hat, and set it on the table to my left. Evening, Woodchuck, I started, and he wiped his mouth with a napkin nervously, and tried to swallow the mouthful of whatever delicacy he was currently wolfing down. Good, wolf are you goofy of? he asked, and his eyes glistened behind his glasses. I wasn't sure what kind of mumbo-jumbo he was trying to pull on me, but I figured two could play in Rio, so I grabbed the steak he'd been working on and slapped it onto the side of my face that still had something's knuckle prints in it. His eyes popped wider, like one of those cartoons where the duck gets his tail feathers shut off, and he gurgled, but I cut him off with a, that's right, and gestured to my cheek. People are working me over because of this case, Woodchuck, and I don't need this steak to tell you I don't like egg on my face. Now, if you got something you're hiding, now's the time to spill it, because next time they might be playing shuffleboard with your noggin. I was lying to him, of course, because Yurov wasn't about to rough up some banker he didn't know over me. But Woodchuck didn't need to know that. Heck, he didn't even know why I was pressing his New York cut against my face. Come to think of it, neither did I. But they did it all the time in the old flicks, so there had to be something to it. Woodchuck blanched, swallowed the rest of the food in his mouth in gulps, and then downed the stem glass of Merlot that accompanied his meal. When he sat back, regaining something he probably once had called composure, I listened and waited. When I was... When Hennessy and Brock... When those murdered men... Well, one night, I threw up a hand in frustration and barked, Good God, man! You have more starts than to choose your own adventure! Woodchuck started visibly, looking like I'd taken a swing at him, and for a second, Liberty Bell helped me. I wanted to. When I was working with Hennessy and Brock, this was a couple of years ago, you understand. I was newer to the office and, well, I wasn't well-liked. Uh, by the ladies, you understand. And Brock... He said he could help me meet a nice girl. Woodchuck's face took on a more pink hue as he progressed, and he looked up less. I took a bite of the steak as he spoke and tried not to think about how much like Porky Pig he was starting to resemble. So, one night, after an office party, Brock said he had a nice girl for me to meet and invited me to his home. He said Hennessy and some others were going to be there, a pleasant gathering. So I, I went. I, I, I took a bottle of wine and some flowers, just to be nice. Uh, girls like wine and flowers, you, you know. Here he looked so mournful that I wanted to pitch him out the window and order all the Long Islands, but I kept my trap shut and waited for the end of his story. 
So when I got there, Brock and Hennessy were there, and Hennessy had a date, and an attractive young woman was there too. We all started drinking, and Brock told some funny stories, and I gave her the flowers. It was becoming a nice evening, and then he broke off and abruptly did something I hadn't expected him to do. He burst, right there, into the saddest, wettest, snotty tears a fat man had ever cried in my presence. She was a nice girl, Mr. Carrington, he blubbered, and I held up a hand to control the volume, because people's heads were bound to start turning any minute. Easy, easy there. You want to cry yourself to death? Just be easy, I encouraged him. Woodchuck shook his head and continued through his sobs. We, we drank too much. Uh, I woke up in a room, on a bed, and sh she was in an improper state. And Hennessy and Brock were there laughing. They had, they had been taking photographs, Mr. Carrington, of her and I. His eyes went wide, and he reached thick fingers for my hands. Of course, my hand shot under the table and held onto the seat covers for dear life. I hadn't touched her, not really, uh, nothing indecent. I was so sloshed I couldn't think straight, and neither could she. And then, then Brock and Hennessy. They said they would show those pictures to everyone if, if I didn't play ball. What could I do? What, what could I do? So, I, I agreed. Hennessy called me a cab, and when I asked about the girl, Brock said he'd take her home. And I passed out when I was in the cab, I swear. I, I didn't want to leave her, but I was, I was drunk. The cold, steely fingers of Lady Justice were coiling around my neck, and my tongue was dry. I fixed an unwavering stare on Woodchuck. And what happened to the girl, Filbert? His face stared mournfully back at me. I never saw her again.